my back still hasn't healed. <laughs> Mainly because I'm pushing it, but... You know... I don't know about you, but there's something special to me. And maybe I'm one of the few weird ones, but... There's something... I really like about being alone. No, really. <laughs> I can go to a church and if nobody's in the sanctuary, I'm thrilled. <laughs> I'll go in. I'm a little cold, so I have to wear my hoodie. And my hair's a mess, so <laughs> that's why I look the way I do. It's early morning. Nobody's awake. But there's something special to me about getting up early or going to a sanctuary when it's empty. I remember I was doing some missionary work and uh, helping to open up a really old, old church. You know, a pastor friend of mine was renovating this church that was been around standing, you know, out in the fields for over a hundred years and it was really an old old church you know those foundations were bricks <laughs> and rocks but uh, the pews were still in it and they were old old pews you know and the, the church needed to be kind of guarded you know and protected because we had set up a sound system inside and the windows were old paned windows and they'd be easily broken into and this church sat out in the farmlands and it was no real security so the pastor being kind of a worship leader also was really nervous about his sound equipment and he really couldn't haul it in and out and coming from long distance so I was living pretty far away you know, over two or three hours and I just said hey you know I'll, I'll camp out in church you know I'll I'll stay here and I'll, I'll sleep, you know, during this time that we're renovating it, you know. I'll, like I had done previously in Mexico, same thing, was I had lived in a church or camped out in the church while we were building it. I said, you know, I, I, I like doing this, you know. So the pastor, you know, a friend of mine, he uh, said, okay, you know, if you're willing to stay here, I'll leave the sound equipment, you know. So it was pretty much my responsibility to hang out, you know, and, be alone protecting you know guarding <laughs> yes sir you know the sound equipment which really you know is just like a caretaker you know nothing big or really important nothing you would notice or special no big gold star in heaven but you know I loved it I spent so much time with my God and I it was wonderful it was wow you would say magical. It was mysterious. It was cool. <laughs> it was a time I really enjoyed. And, you know, there was times, you know, that were probably boring, I guess, for some. There were times where, you know, I wasn't always reading the Word or listening to God speak, and He did. It wasn't always times of, you know, something going on. Sometimes there was nothing. Sometimes it was a matter of just learning how to breathe, learning how to listen, rediscovering how to be still. A very wise Christian told me something interesting in Anchorage, Alaska, and it had a lot to do with being alone with God. And he said, have you ever watched the sunrise? And, you know, my first thought was like you, you know, well, yeah, of course. And he said, no. He was an old kind of native kind of guy, you know, old timers that always have some point to what they're saying, you know, kind of sagely wisdom. He says, no. Have you ever watched a sunrise? So, I, you know, me being a little bit smarter said well what do you mean by watching a sunrise 
and he said, have you ever watched the stars fade away and the sky turn to gray and the light begin to shine from the moment of darkness to the moment of cracking the dawn? I said, cracking the dawn? I thought, that's an interesting, interesting way of saying it. You know, because I was a writer, and I thought, that's beautiful. Cracking the dawn, you know. So one day I decided to go out, you know, and where I lived, I could look over the Chugach, you know, Chugach range of mountains that surround Anchorage. And I decided that I was going to sit and watch the sunrise. And I did, and it took hours. <laughs> it took a long time. Almost froze to death. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But, you know, it took a long time. And I wasn't, you know, drinking coffee and everything. I was practicing a self-discipline, so to speak, a, what used to be called an old meditation. You know, I wasn't like, you know, crossing my legs and holding my fingers and going, um. No, I was watching what happens at a sunrise. It was wonderful experience, and I've done it before and since, you know, and I enjoyed it, you know. And I wonder if in our society, in seeking to move so fast and do things so quickly because the pressure is on, you know, the tyranny of the urgent, the things that need to be done in our 24-hour period, we think is 24 hours, actually 23 and whatever hours, Maybe those aren't God's timing scales. Maybe His timing isn't our timing, and His ways aren't our ways. Maybe there's a time and a place to be alone with God. And you know, I really do enjoy not being in a mega church. I love not being with thousands of people. I thoroughly enjoy sometimes not all the time, because sometimes I like a few more people around, but I thoroughly enjoy that after time in a sanctuary. You know, sometimes when the church is emptied out and you're sitting there alone, or maybe there's one or two people, you know, in the sanctuary, you know, and it's like, oh wow, is Jesus going to walk through? And I feel that every time. I almost feel like as though God visits each church after the service to see who's waiting on him. We used to call it in Calvary Chapel an afterglow where people used to get together after the service in order to worship more and wait more on the Lord and let the Holy Spirit move as he chooses. Eh, you know, not so much anymore. You know, I don't see it on Sunday mornings at all. You know, there's this mad dash for, you know, let's go get some coffee and juice, you know, and donuts and, you know, the whole sugar fix, you know, because after all, they're not really morning people, or if they are, they're healthy people and they want to do their whatever routines for the day. But I've often wondered if we're not forsaking the Lord in some ways of being alone with Him. The time afterwards for me was always the most important time. And when I was at Big Calvary, I was pretty much well known for being one of the ones they chased out of the sanctuary. Romaine. <laughs> Get out! I'm locking up! Lights would flicker, you know. After a while they'd be, they didn't used to do the lights flickering, but after a while they did the lights flickering so you know you're supposed to get out. <clears throat> but you know, I used to love it because you could always tell when there was a really good service. Because after a really good service, almost nobody left. Well, you know, most people left, but there was a lot of people in the sanctuary, and I was like, I'd sit there, and I'd sometimes be by myself, you know, once in a while someone would come over and talk to me, but most of the time I'd be by myself, and I'd look around, and man, everybody just doesn't want to leave, they were like, cool, and I thought it was great, <laughs> maybe I'm a little weird, maybe your church, you don't feel that experience, I don't know, in my own personal relationship with God as I live it out all the days that I have on this planet until I move on, you know, to what God wants, then uh, 
I sometimes neglect that beautiful time alone in the morning. Fidivo gives me a chance to, but sometimes I get carried away still with this ministry to hurry up and get post posted on Facebook or Blogger or WordPress to hurry up and write something new, you know, and add it to the volume of works that God has, you know, inspired me to do to share and relate, you know, my personal relationship with the Lord and to inspire someone else to go higher, farther, to take the next step of faith, the next growth that they might need in order to know Jesus more, to see him in his temple, to experience heaven on earth. Sometimes I get carried away that way. Because I really want people to know Jesus better than I do, more than I do, because maybe they'll they'll drag me along with them or share with me something I never thought of. I remember <laughs> one brother that I met, you know, that we used to spend hours, I mean just hours talking about Jesus, actually met me after a service. He saw me sitting by myself, just, you know, dinking around, doing the work, you know, not being asked to, not being told to, but just taking care of what needed to be done. And he, when he first met me, observed and told me that. He said, well, I've noticed that you, uh, you don't, you know, wait to be told. You just go do what needs to be done. You know, you just seem to pick up and clean up and take care of whatever anybody else isn't doing. And then as soon as you see someone doing it, you move on to something else. I said, well, yeah. I said, you know, just something needs to be done. He said, well, you know, talk to me for a few minutes. He says, well, do you do it because, you know, you think it's the Lord's watching? I said, no, not really. I said, you know, I don't really care if the Lord's watching, <laughs> frankly. I said, you know, God watches on lots of things. He sees us all the time. You know, then we got into this big discussion. But I said, you know, it's really not so important that God sees what I'm doing as much as I know why I'm doing what I'm doing. You know, I do it because I love seeing the people not have to worry about the practical things so they can concentrate on the spiritual things because they get distracted by the practical and don't focus in on the spiritual. I said, you know, if it was my personal preference, I'd get rid of all the churches and the buildings and you know, dump the guitars and throw away the overheads and get rid of sound systems, you know, just so people would learn to worship God again with just that feeling inside of just bursting forth in song, you know, kind of like anyone can do anywhere, anytime. Now, it was interesting because the bro was a, <laughs> a musician <laughs> and he's master at keyboards, you know, and he had synthesizers and all kinds of things and he hadn't really gotten involved in church much this new church that was being started so he says you know that's interesting so we talked for a while and we got to know each other a little bit you know and then one day he brought all his equipment in <laughs> wow you see he had learned at times to be alone with God and he enjoyed our conversations that we took from our personal relationships with God and we shared what it was that we brought from that personal time to each other in conversation and communication and we began to relate to each other in an intimate way and a personal way and it was wonderful you know the things that we talked about as far as Jesus and God was concerned it was just amazing to me do you stop long enough to listen are you in such a hurry to go do what you planned to do can God interrupt your day long enough to make you stop and I don't mean pray like throw some Our Father or Hail Mary or even just talk do you take the time to pray in the way of listening only, without saying a word? The greatest prayer is the one that's never heard. I was told that by another friend, you know. The greatest prayer 
you'll ever see is the one that's never heard. I love that. I think that's so true. Because there comes a time and a place, I was taught, in your relationship with God that you don't ask anymore. You don't have to. You're content. The Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. And I think that the only way really to get godliness isn't so much about the doing as the being. Just learning to be. When God spoke to Moses and said that, I am that I am, the words meant also that I will be what I will be. To my people, I will be what I will be. It's a play on words, but it's also an interesting thing in Hebrew because you'll get people saying, I am that I am, and they'll get into all the self-existence, self-efficient, whatever kind of descriptive terminology the Hebrew describes. But the thing most people forget is what it ascribes to the Lord. And it's a phraseology in Hebrew that a lot of times gets lost in the way of the people, how they use phrases to explain, or God used this particular phrase to explain himself. And it was like being, you know, it's, it's a philosophical kind of statement of scientific fact, you know, sci-fi kind of theoretical. And what I mean by that is like, God is, and that's all there is, because that's what he said in the beginning. In the beginning, God. God is. That's, he doesn't explain his fact of being. He doesn't relate in the sense of saying, I'm going to prove myself and here's how. He doesn't say, you know, the proofs. He just says, I am. And that's all there is. And you know, that's so deep and yet so simple. Do we ever stop long enough? Wait long enough? Be still long enough to know He is? Watch the sunrise. Try it. Go to a park. Watch people come and go. Be old for a moment, like, you know, the, you see these old movies, you know. Of course, I keep forgetting. I'm getting old, and I keep thinking I'm getting younger. You know, typical age differentiation of inside versus outside. My outside shows I'm getting older. My inside says, really? <laughs> okay. But, um, you know, those old scenes you see in movies where you see some old-timer sitting in the park feeding the pigeons, you know. <laughs> well, forget feeding the pigeons, but just become an observer. Look around. Be mindful. Watch. I did that just this last time at a church that I'm attending. and It was interesting because you learn a lot about people just by watching them. You know, some people call it people watching, some people call it gossip, <laughs> you know, whatever. Depends on your reaction to it, you know, what you do with your action. But I watched what people did, what they were talking about, who they were talking about. I listened. Sometimes I stand back and I watch and I work security and different things, so I learned to be still, stand still, kind of fade into the woodwork, you know, or not be obvious sometimes, you know. Some people say, you know, you're hard to hide, you know, with his nose, <laughs> who knows. But I watched people in action. And when they're busy, they don't notice you're watching. They have no clue. And I'm always aware of people around me. I'm just one of those things. You know, just notice everything. Maybe it's because I'm a writer. But God, I always picture it walking through every service. Because it says that the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro, seeing whom he may act strong on their behalf. He searches the hearts. He examines the soul. He comes in an hour of visitation that we do not know. Do you expect Jesus to meet you? Do you expect Jesus to greet you? I do.
because it's happened before. So I expect it any time now. Because <laughs> the first time was a shock. Now it's an expectation. But don't be surprised if there's more to your life as a believer, as a Christian, than what you think. Don't think that this Old Testament kind of experiences that these guys had was like limited to the Old Testament, you know, and that somehow you know God doesn't like directly intervene or send angels or step into our perspective and reveal Himself, you know, our dimension. Don't be surprised if God opens your eyes to more in your faith and your life as a Christian than you've ever known before one day and you suddenly go oh man I thought I had it all down I thought I learned it all I thought you know I've been through the Bible six times or seven or whatever it may be and I thought I, I had it all and then suddenly God went pew, peeled back the sky and I saw heaven for the first time and whoa I can't even describe it I can't even relate to it. I can't even tell others about it. That's when your faith begins. That's when your real Christianity takes hold, when you realize, wow, there's so much more in store. Man, we haven't even started yet. This is all just like the sandlot for kindergarten. We haven't even gotten to first grade yet. When you realize that, you might look at all of creation, all human beings, your church, your pastor, your elder, your deacon, the people that have grown up with you or know you or you know them or, or maybe you just participate with them in, in your relationship, in religion or faith. When you discover that with God, you uncover the reality of what Jesus wanted for us. He wants us to know so much more than going to church. Although that's a good place to start, but it's not a place to end. God has so much more in store for you. If you'll just slow down, be still, and instead of knowing God in the congregation of the mighty, or the many, you'll know God in the isolation of the realization of knowing Him face to face, one to one, because God's looking for those kinds of people, and He wants you to be one of them.